of the program on Brazil. And I'm also a professor in the anthropology department. I have a dual appointment with anthropology and sociology. Um, and I uh, do research in Brazil. I've been going to Brazil for most of my life. Um, and I have the best job in the world, really, which is to promote the country that I love. And I'm guessing that all of you, since you're in Portuguese, have a similar kind of um, interest, fascination, love for Brazil. Yes, Is that yeah, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> right. That's usually how people end up finding themselves in Portuguese, right? Is that there was something. It was the music or the culture um, or what? Or novellas, right? Exactly, right? Or soccer or capoeira. Sometimes people do capoeira and then they fall in love with Brazil from capoeira, right? So there's all these like interesting avenues into, into Brazil in that sense. And then you end up in Portuguese and you realize that Portuguese is also beautiful and amazing and, you know, is the best when sung and you know all this stuff, right? So, um, so I can I can really relate to that because that's sort of how I came um, came to Brazil. So let me just talk a little tiny bit about about the program and what it does, and then I'll share with you guys a little bit just about my own um, trajectory in terms of how I got interested in Brazil and how I learned Portuguese and sort of the impact that that's had on my career. So the program on Brazil, um, we've been here since 2014. And the mission of the program really is to promote Brazil and um, uh, both in terms of faculty research, helping um, faculty to do, to do more research, to adopt new kinds of projects in Brazil. It also has to do with curriculum in terms of take, staffing and creating more classes related to Brazil for students. Um, also doing study abroad. And lastly, engaging with the Brazilian community here and engaging in outreach in the general community in San Diego to show people what is so incredible about Brazil. Um, so I have been here, I just got here, I've been here since August, and I've been working on sort of advancing all of these goals. Some of this is through my own research, some of this is through working with other researchers, um, both in the College of Arts and Letters and also um, beyond. We have some, been working on some really neat new partnerships with people in the sciences. Um, some of it is through events. So we try to do like the one that I'm not going to flip back to the slide since it's too bright. Um, but doing events to really showcase um, what's going on in Brazil, get people excited about it and thinking about it and engage in different kinds of academic debate. Um, I've also developed a study abroad course that's um, going for the first time this summer. It's called Inequality and Activism in Brazil. So we spend some time learning about the different forms that inequality takes. Um, but the main part of the learning really happens in country as we meet with different activists who share their experience uh, and discuss with us as a group sort of the day-to-day -day work of working for greater social justice in Brazil. So I always try to emphasize that the activists in this case are really the teachers. Um, I'm there to facilitate it, but who we're learning from are the people that are actually doing this um, day in and day out. And I've done this program a couple of times in the past, and it's always incredibly inspirational. Um, so, so in addition, like I said, we do events, we have study abroad, we have curriculum that we've been supporting, and faculty research, as well as student research. Um, we have funding that we also, that is available on a competitive basis for students that want to study abroad, for students that want to do research. Um, oftentimes our faculty are looking for students to help on research projects, and we have funding to support that too. Um, so if you were here and you were doing IB or any other major, we would hope, of course, that um, you guys would want to be involved in the life of the program, um, coming to events and participating and being part of our community. Uh, so in terms of my own personal story, Cassia said, like, say something about you know, <laughs> how you got here, how you were interested in Brazil. Um, so I usually, when people ask me this, I always say that I'm like a great example of how the choices of your parents come to influence your entire life. Um, my mother played in a Brazilian band. She played the surdu, you know, like the big gigantic drum. Um, and she was, fell in love with Brazil, was fascinated with Brazil, and took us kids with her when she would go. Um, to study music. So I started going when I was pretty young. Um, it was pretty incredible. I learned, I learned Portuguese actually by being there, by singing, by hanging out with like the other people that played, in, played music with her. Um, and I had gone, like I graduated, I went to college. I didn't really, it wasn't really, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I don't know if this is a similar story to you guys. I, I went, I was like, oh, I'm not really into this and I decided to drop out. I went home and my mom was like, what are you going to do? You don't, like, you're supposed to go to college. And I said, well, how about if I go to Brazil instead? 
And she was like, okay, you know, that's fine. <laughs> you know, so I went and stayed with some friends of hers, um, and I lived outside of Sao Paulo for a while. And when I came back, I was like, okay, what I want to do is Brazil. But, you know, what kind of major is that? Mm -hmm. So I looked at, I started applying to different programs, and I found one of the top Portuguese programs in the country is at, at IU, at uh, Indiana University. So I went to study Portuguese, and I was a Portuguese major. I spoke Portuguese already from being there, but I couldn't write. I was like functionally illiterate because I had never, I had never had to write anything, you know, all of what I had learned was speaking. Um, eventually I realized I wasn't going to major in Portuguese. I wanted actually really to do history and anthropology, so I, I kept the double major. And, um, but, but really that experience of learning the language and having that passion for the country has been a thread through my whole life. Um, has completely defined my career and all the choices that I have made. And time and time again the Portuguese was a thing that was unusual and a thing that opened doors for me, right? Because Portuguese is just a language that's not commonly spoken in the US. Not a lot of people speak Portuguese. And so um, I think that I've seen this with my students and I've also had this experience myself, is that it really is a unique skill that you can be used to make you really marketable for, for jobs. And so um, I always encourage people, and you, you don't need this because you guys are already thinking like this because you're already studying it, but I really always encourage students to think about it because it is unique um, and it can be something that then begins to direct your future career. Um, so I could talk about my research. Would you like to hear a little bit about my research too? Um, maybe, okay. <laughs> um, so I've always been interested, I think because um, because I had always been, I've been going to Brazil my whole life, right? And I was always kind of this person, I wasn't Brazilian, but we'd been there a lot. I was always in this kind of like in-between position where I wasn't exactly a tourist, but I wasn't Brazilian either. So I think that this sort of began to shape the sorts of questions that I was interested in, um, which have a lot, to, which initially led me to an interest in tourism. So I started off looking at different forms of tourism in Brazil, um, but I'm also an anthropologist and I study social inequality and violence. So I was looking at forms of tourism that, um, that focus on Brazil's problems. So I have, my dissertation is on favela tourism, um, and I'm basically looking at how social problems, how narco-trafficking and policing becomes um, something that is attractive to tourists, something to see while on holiday. So for that project, um, I lived in the largest favela in Brazil, Rocinha, which is in Rio, um, for two years. And um, I did field work there. So in addition to learning about tourism, I also had to learn about the kinds of things that were being featured in this tourism. So I started also researching the narco traffic. I started researching police. And then I put all of it together kind of into a book that was about narco traffickers and police and the way in which they are sold as a product for tourists. I did not get death threats. I'm sorry. Well, I'm sorry. It's not the right response to that. I, I did not get death threats. Um, so I did. I did not get death threats at all. So the time that I um, the time that I lived in the in the community was strangely a time that was very tranquil. Partly because the narco traffic was in total control, um, and so the they were usually when there's problems, it's when there's a dispute over power. When somebody has power, things are relatively calm and tranquil because there's it's clear who's in charge and who makes the rules and whatever. So um, and no, they were very uh, the the parallel power as we could call them were very nice, very polite, very happy that we lived there, wanted very much to showcase what they thought was, you know, a really amazing place to live and their own system of law and order. So no, I did not get death threats um, <laughs> at all. And in general, it was uh, straight. It sounds strange to say it because it's a place that has a lot of problems and a place that has a really high level of sort of everyday violence. It was really safe in, in other ways. Um, so I, I've written a book about that. Um, and I've continued, I've now been going to that same community for more than 10 years, and so I have had this really long-term engagement. I usually take students with me when we go. We go and visit all the people that I, that I worked with when I, um, when I lived there, I go to some of the NGOs. I, I did a lot of NGO work and taught English, and so we go and meet all those people. And it's pretty cool because a lot of the ki people that were kids when I was there doing my dissertation field work are now you know, in their 20s and doing their own work with NGOs. And so it's, it's kind of neat to get a really long-term picture of a place like that. A lot changes and a lot stays the same. <laughs> yeah. Isn't the beaches, I mean, aren't the beaches out there much cleaner than out here? Because out here, 
Mm, uh, no, I would say, I would say no. <laughs> Unfortunately, they're gorgeous, right? And you can go to amazing beaches that if you want to drive a little bit out of the cities, you can find amazing spots. The city beaches, you know, are not super clean just because it's a big urban area. Um, However, you know, we could literally walk from our house in the favela to the beach in, you know, 10 minutes. Yeah. Um, so this is one of the amazing things about Brazil in general, but especially about Rio, that there's a, an incredible contrast um, yeah. between sort of extreme poverty and extreme wealth, and you can kind of cut across the two in five minutes. Um, so that's always something that's really interesting for students. And, and all of the kind of stuff that I, that, that I teach about in my classes and my research is not divorced from, I don't think, you know, interest in business and, and, and other kinds of interests because all of this is part of Brazilian culture and Brazilian society and it influences then how people think about what they do um, in general. And having an understanding of all of this stuff is important. Um, if you were going to work for an American company, for example, um, if you were going to do an internship in Brazil, you would kind of want to have a sense of these overall issues around social problems and, and sort of what the different opinions that there are about them. And so um, I generally talk about, I talk a lot about that kind of stuff in my classes, but I think it has a larger relevance. Um, and Brazil also is very useful always for thinking about the US. That sounds kind of funny, but I find that Brazil, Brazil is is a productive mirror for us um, in that we have so many of the same issues in this country uh, and oftentimes it's harder for us to perceive them because we're close to them and when you look at the same kinds of dynamics in Brazil they're often much sort of clearer or flashier or something and it allows you then to reflect back on you know use the global to reflect back on the local. Yeah, I don't know really why I asked that because like <laughs> I live close to the beach and the funny mm -hmm. thing is that every time it rains they close it off. Because uh, yeah. Spills. yeah, there's a, we don't go, I don't go to the beach in Brazil the day after it rains either. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but <laughs> yeah, it's a problem, right? But there's, this is another thing that's interesting if you're interested in environmental issues or urban development issues, Brazil's really good for thinking about this stuff because you have these really big cities where, you know, there's a lot of sort of like quote unquote underdevelopment around infrastructure and also a lot of really interesting innovative projects that are being done to to try to deal with that. So it's also really it's very interesting for urban planning too, which is a little closer to my area. Other questions? Anyway, I will let Cassia talk then, but we hope very much that, um, I hope very much that if you, if you are here, I have recently proposed, it's not, it's, this is, I guess, for the video. <laughs> it's, um, it hasn't been um, completely approved, but we have uh, a certificate program that we're working on right now, which is really, which you can, again, add on to any major or any existing program, um, which is really aimed at, at just giving you some, breadth and depth around Brazil. So the curriculum is incredibly broad. It's 12 to 12 units basically in a great variety of disciplines. You can take classes that have Brazil content in Africana studies, anthropology, sociology, Latin American studies, history. Um, I'm going to forget some of the other ones, but there's a, a, a big list of possibilities. And all of those the classes that you can count in the certificate have substantial Brazil content. Um, but many of them are comparative. So you'd be taking a class that compares Brazil and the US or a class in which Brazil is a case study, um, but might not be the, the central focus. So it gives you a lot of flexibility, and it also allows you to always think about Brazil in global context, which is really, I think, a, a really important thing to be doing. Um, so as soon as that comes out, we put it in the curriculum process, and it hasn't hasn't come out of curriculum. Here we have a bureau bureaucracy for these kinds of things that take some time. Um, but in the next year or so, hopefully it will come out as a, as a possibility, and you can add a certificate program. And those classes are taught in English, um, so it's a, it would be a complement. You could also do a, a Portuguese minor. Um, which would be classes primarily almost entirely in Portuguese. These are classes that are, that are all taught in English. So it compl would complement the kinds of things that you'd be doing in Portuguese class. But it has more of a society and politics focus um, and less of a culture and arts focus or literature focus, let's say, for example. So it's a little bit different. We have lots of good options. Let's just say that. <laughs> Cassia, I'll let you come and talk a little bit about language. I'm going to leave this maybe right here for you. Okay, so we can get started on uh, another overview about Portuguese at San Diego State. Uh, we're going to talk about the options you have for language here at San Diego State at the College of Arts and Letters. You guys have uh, a new minor in Portuguese and Brazilian studies. The focus uh, uh, is on language and literature. And then you have courses that you can take to improve your Portuguese language skills. 
We have currently we have three years of Portuguese language, and um, and then that are between lower division and upper division courses, as well as literature and culture of Brazil and other Lusophone countries like we had talked prior in class. And uh, so you're able to pursue not only a degree maybe in international business, but you could also take the courses, the same courses that you take um, for your emphasis in Portuguese uh, through College of Arts and Letters and, and additional courses in Portuguese just for your personal language enhancement and um, and also to learn more about the culture and life in Brazil and other Portuguese speaking countries across the globe. Um, the minor is constituted of 15 units. Nine of these units have to be upper division courses in language and culture and, or literature and uh, you do graduate with a minor in Portuguese from the College of Arts and Letters, and the courses are held at the Department of Spanish and Portuguese. But we are all integrated here under the umbrella of College of Arts and Letters. So that's another option you have in case you are considering perhaps not only international business as a major, but any other major. You can still focus on Portuguese through the minor in Portuguese. Do you have any questions about it? No? Do you have any flyer on that? We do, yeah, I do have some brochures that um, I'll be giving to you guys once you um, are satisfied with any answers that, to questions you may have. <laughs> but the, the courses range um, from language courses, like the courses you are taking currently at Southwestern College, language one, two, three, and four, which is for the four first semesters in Portuguese. Uh, which by the end of the fourth semester you should be reaching a, an intermediate high level of proficiency in the language. Uh, there are new courses that are now being offered since last year if I'm not mistaken. Um, there is advanced reading and writing in Portuguese as well as advanced listening and speaking in Portuguese and other courses in, in um, Brazilian culture, music, literature, and um, I hope I'm not forgetting anything else, but those are the main core courses for the upper division classes. And, and they're um, also general education courses. So some of the upper division courses are taught in English with highlights in Portuguese, and, but all the language specific courses that bring you to a higher proficiency level are taught in, in an immersion format exclusively in Portuguese and which allows you to develop your skills as a fluent speaker of the language. Any other questions? So we can come to Okay, yeah, so, so these are the additional, this is not a touch screen, uh, the additional activities that we have here. So through the College of Arts and Letters in, in collaboration with Program on Brazil, uh, a group of students uh, facilitated by a tutor from the Department of Spanish and Portuguese um, gathers together every Wednesday around the Turtle Pond area, the Scripps Cottage area where I showed you guys earlier. Um, they gather together every Wednesday from 12.30 to 1.30 and um, to sit and talk. And the cool thing about that is that the tutor, of course, is an advanced speaker of Portuguese, or he may or, or she may be Brazilian. Uh, and um, so you have that 101 experience of asking questions, practicing Portuguese, getting to listen to other people's questions and experiences. A lot of the students that go abroad actually come back and they want to share their experiences during Bachepapo. So they often come and tell you stories, show their pictures of the times that they spent over there. And also sometimes you have guest speakers. In the past, when I was more involved with Bachupapu, uh, we would bring guest speakers such as the Capoeira Masters. They would do a little workshop on Capoeira. Uh, sometimes people would bring their guitar and just simply play music in Portuguese and everybody would sing and, and have a good time. But the goal is also uh, to meet and network with other people who have similar interests and, and 
besides learning Portuguese, also meeting new people on campus and developing other connections with similar interests than you guys. So it's every Wednesday. Uh, yeah, my name is still on there. So in case you have any questions, <laughs> you can always reach out, right? Uh, and that's one of the things we do. Sometimes we also, on a semester basis, we also have, through the Department of Spanish and Portuguese, we have the Portuguese Awards Ceremony coming up next month. And uh, that's um, an incentive event that we have been coordinating with the Department of Spanish and Portuguese that promotes or incentivizes the study of the language and the culture of Lusophone countries. So students in lower division courses, upper division courses, are getting awards uh, for their performance in the courses. So coming up on the 25th of April, we're going to have a ceremony where all you know, the, uh, the, the coordinators for the programs uh, under the College of Arts and Letters that are involved with Portuguese come to um, meet the students that had a high performance in the courses uh, in Portuguese and you actually get a certificate uh, from the department as well as a, a cash award uh, of a hundred dollars <laughs> for your performance uh, in your courses for obtaining the higher uh, performance uh, for your year in the courses that you attended that year. So these are all things that we do to to motivate you guys to create this community and develop ties and network among people that have similar interests because that also opens doors to you as a, prof as a professional in the future. And as I mentioned to you before, it might even open um, opportunities to work with the professors in the departments as tutors or as assistants uh, working with the language because of your language abilities. So that's very important to just keep in mind that when you're taking your classes, every time you are in the classroom, you're not only there for the grade that you want, but also to showcase your abilities and showcase your potential as future professionals, as well as future teaching assistants or uh, tutors for the programs that um, encompass the Portuguese and the Brazilian culture uh, within the College of Arts and Letters. Any other questions? And I think that more and more we'll have classes and courses that involve Brazil and Brazilian culture. And so these are going to be fun classes. We hope to have music classes for Brazilian music and as well as capoeira. And in the past we had futevoli workshops and we had um, uh, drumming workshops with people from the local community that uh, perform at the Samba Sonic Samba School here in San Diego. And so we are always trying to innovate and bring new people and bring new talents from the community to uh, enhance your skills and to allow you to learn more about the culture of Brazil as well. It's fun. It's always fun. It's educational and it's fun. Right? Any other questions? Well, thank you so much for coming. I really Everybody appreciate it. Us too, if you have yes. And, yeah. yeah. Come and like our social media. Exactly. Be our and fans on friends. Facebook and Instagram. <laughs> and I'll be sending you guys the link so you can actually become friends with our page mm -hmm. and to follow us on social media. Tá bom? Tá bom. Tá bom. Muito obrigada. <laughs>